Steel is a really important industrial material used extensively in construction and manufacturing like cars and ships amongst many other essential items. And it's a major contributor to the world's CO2 emissions, currently making up about 7% of global emissions. Now, steel is an easily and economically recycled material, and already most steel is recycled at the end of its first life. But the global demand for steel is growing, and this is partly because of the expansion of clean energy technologies, as steel is used in things like wind turbine towers and bases for solar panels. Because of this growth, even if we recycled 100% of our steel scrap, there isn't going to be nearly enough to supply global demand over the coming decades. So the CO2 emissions from steel is a problem that we're going to need to solve. And unfortunately, steel is not the easiest sector to decarbonize. In this video, we're going to talk about how steel is traditionally made and where exactly the CO2 emissions come from in that process. Then we're going to talk with steel and hydrogen expert, Dr. Bart Kolodajek, about some alternative processes that we can use to make steel without CO2 emissions and how quickly industry can adopt these. I'm Rosie Barnes. Welcome to Engineering with Rosie. So how are we going to decarbonize steel? Well, if I was going to be pedantic about it, and I am, technically we can't have zero carbon steel. No doubt there are some pedants out there who are already smugly typing away in the comments section, pointing out that steel is by definition a mixture of iron and carbon, and usually some other stuff that's added to the alloy to get specific desired properties. Even very small amounts of carbon added to iron make a big difference to the strength and toughness. Carbon-free steel wouldn't actually be steel at all, it would just be iron. So instead of zero carbon steel, let's go with green steel. But yeah, okay, that's just semantics. It's not actually relevant to the decarbonization challenge associated with steel. Obviously, the carbon in the steel alloy stays in the steel alloy, and it isn't in the air heating up the atmosphere. But in order to transform iron ore into iron and then into steel, there is a ton of CO2 emitted into the atmosphere. 1.9 tonnes to be specific, for every tonne of traditional steel production. To understand where the emissions come from, we need to first talk about how steel is made. Let's start by looking at iron ore. Iron ore is an oxide, a chemical compound of iron atoms, Fe, and oxygen, O. Some of the common iron ores are magnetite and hematite, and where they occur naturally, it basically just looks like regular dirt. To get the iron out of that dirt, you need to split the oxide molecules and separate the iron and the oxygen in a chemical reaction called reduction. In traditional steelmaking processes, iron ore is reduced by adding carbon, usually in the form of uh, coking coal, to the iron ore inside of the blast furnace. The carbon atoms join with the oxygen from the ore, leaving relatively pure iron behind. And then what happens to the carbon and oxygen atoms that combined? They form carbon dioxide, which is simply released into the atmosphere. Around 70% of the CO2 emissions from this method of steel making comes from this blast furnace process alone. You could in theory capture the carbon dioxide from the flue gases. And I suppose that since hydrogen that's produced with carbon capture is called blue hydrogen, that must mean that steel that's produced with carbon capture would be called blue steel. But aside from the ability to make that Zoolander reference, there isn't much to recommend blue steel as an option because it would consume a lot of extra energy and add a lot of extra cost to the process. And as far as I know, no one is actually pursuing carbon capture as a way to make clean steel. Other ways that you can get rid of that big chunk of CO2 emissions from the blast furnace are by using green hydrogen instead of carbon to react with the oxygen in iron ore, in which case you would emit H2O, water, instead of CO2. Or you could use carbon from biomass instead of from coal, which still emits CO2 in flue gases, but that same amount of CO2 was previously removed from the atmosphere when the plant was growing. After the blast furnace, we get pig iron, which is mostly pure iron, but it also contains higher than desired levels of carbon and other impurities. So it needs further processing to make it into steel. So that is basic oxygen steel making, and it's how about 75% of today's steel is made. The second main way that steel is made is in an electric arc furnace, EAF, which applies an electric current directly to a feedstock of a combination of recycled steel scrap or direct reduced iron and a bit of pig iron to get the chemical balance right. The electric arc melts the steel and then oxygen is blown over and impurities react with the oxygen, forming a slag that floats on the surface of the molten steel, which can then be removed. Emissions from electric arc furnace are much lower than blast furnace, and it mostly comes from the high electricity consumption. So as electricity grids decarbonize, these emissions will decrease too. 
So EAF is great for recycling scrap steel, but you can't use it on its own for making steel from iron ore. So as long as we need to produce more steel than we're getting from scrap, it won't be enough on its own to clean up the steel industry. There is also another way to get iron from iron ore, DRI, direct reduced iron. In DRI, the oxygen is removed from iron ore by reacting it with carbon or another reducing gas produced from natural gas or coal without melting it. And then the iron needs to be further processed to make steel. So that's how we make steel and where the emissions come from traditional steel manufacturing. You can see that eliminating CO2 from the process isn't nearly as simple as just simply swapping out fossil fueled electricity for renewables. And this is the reason that steel is often cited as one of the hard to abate sectors. I got in touch with Dr. Bart Kolodejcik, who's been working on hydrogen and energy systems for over a decade with a recent focus on green steel. I wanted to ask him about using hydrogen to make green steel. And he did tell me about that, but he also told me about a couple of emerging alternative green steel making processes that can take us from iron ore to steel without using a blast furnace. These are based on electrolysis, a technique in chemistry that uses electricity to split compounds. For example, to take iron ore to iron plus oxygen and splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen is another example of electrolysis that I've covered on this channel before. I started the conversation with Bart by talking about how hard steel is to decarbonize compared to other industries. I would actually say that it's uh, pretty much low hanging fruit. So I would say it's probably one of the easier industries. And the reason for that is that steel is actually produced at large scale and it's, it's kind of centralized in a um, few different geographies globally. And because it's actually so much easier to address that issue compared to transportation where, where you have thousands or millions of cars on the road. So you have to basically replace all of them. And, you know, with um, emerging hydrogen, you can actually reuse or retool most of that existing steelmaking infrastructure. And basically, instead of using coking coal or natural gas, you can use green reductants like hydrogen or ammonia to uh, basically reduce iron ore into iron and then further convert it to steel. But um, obviously, to, to decarbonize this process, we will have to rely on very large amounts of hydrogen. And the advantage of using hydrogen is that you don't actually have to build completely new infrastructure. Obviously, you will have to build new power generation, renewable power generation to uh, supply enough electrons to your electrolyzer plant. And you will also have to build that electrolyzer plant. But, you know, blast furnace or DRI, you can effectively reuse and retool. And those major um, steel makers globally, they are actually looking at just doing that. Instead of spending significant amount of money on completely new technology, emerging technology that is probably not up to scale just yet. Another good thing with that pathway is that you can actually use blends. So you can use a fraction of hydrogen and increase it in the future. So um, it, it's going to be, let's say, hydrogen mixed with natural gas. So your produced iron or steel won't be completely green, but um, at least you slowly but effectively reduce that um, CO2 emission. What are the other ways that we can make um, green, green steel? One is basically molten oxide electrolysis that was developed by um, Professor Sarovey at MIT. So but Boston Metal is basically a spin-off from MIT that is trying to commercialize that technology. Um, and um, in this case, it's... They call it electrochemical process. It's um, electrochemical reduction, but I would actually call it thermoelectrochemical because you actually have to um, heat up your feedstock and your electrolyte to significant temperatures to actually liquefy it to be able to perform that electrochemical reduction. And in this case, um, in case of Boston Metal, that temperature is anywhere between 1,400 to 1,500 degrees Celsius. So it's actually quite significant. When you want to operate this plant using highly intermittent power supply like wind and solar, obviously that, that thermal inertia will be probably a limiting factor because you will have to spend a number of hours to uh, heat up your process. But the advantage of this molten oxide electrolysis is that it's actually very efficient. And, and then also with uh, Boston Metal Technology, you can actually start with iron ore and you can go directly to steel. So you can basically alloy that produced iron in the process and your resulting product will be uh, steel of different composition. Another technology that is kind of tailored for intermittent power supply is um, low temperature 
electrolysis or um, iron ore reduction. That process can operate anywhere between, I would say, 60 to probably 150 or just about degrees Celsius. Your electrolyte is aqueous with different salts in it. You basically either dissolve or uh, disperse your feedstock, so your iron ore, and then you basically um, reduce it electrochemically. Is this your preferred method of um, of grain steel making? Um, look, I, I would say so because, you know, there, there are a number of advantages. I guess you can distinguish those advantages on three different levels. So, um, you know, how well this process uh, follows intermittent power supply from renewables like wind and solar. Then secondly, it's actually very selective. So you can actually reduce one type of metal, whereas other metals that might be part of your iron ore remain basically untouched. And then thirdly, you know, in terms of CAPEX, it's actually quite simple because it's probably not one step process like Boston Metal, because you still, in, in that process, you produce pure iron. So you still have to convert it to steel using, let's say, electric arc furnace. But, you know, it's probably simpler or less CAPEX intensive compared to a um, traditional method. So do you think, um, looking forward to the, the, the future, um, so you, you kind of said at the start that the hydrogen method is maybe a faster way to um, decarbonize steel, that right? You see that happening in the near future that we'll see hydrogen and then maybe later on see the electrochemical processes? When you look at um, steel makers globally, they are actually already starting with hydrogen. But as I said before, we hope that by now we will have um, plenty of hydrogen around, green hydrogen. That's not the case. So reusing and retooling existing infrastructure is probably the easiest way. And then in the future, as those emerging technologies kind of uh, mature, there will be a big shift going away from thermochemical processes to electrochemical processes. Hydrogen is emerging, so reusing that existing infrastructure will be advantage. But same time, I would say... Um, Hydrogen is great. I've been doing it for 13 years, but I believe that we should electrify processes wherever we can because it's so much more efficient. Thanks, Bart, for that. It's funny because I actually originally intended that this would be a video about green steel produced using hydrogen. And that was kind of in response to criticisms that I've gotten that I'm always so negative about hydrogen. I mostly make videos about things that I think that hydrogen is badly suited to. And so I wanted to make a video about a sector that I thought hydrogen was well suited to decarbonize. Based on Bart's background, working so many years with hydrogen since way before it was cool, I thought he was going to tell me all about his enthusiasm for making clean steel that way. And I mean, he did share enthusiasm about using hydrogen to begin cleaning up steel right now. And we're seeing several companies already developing projects like that. Some examples are in Sweden and in Australia, where there are projects in various stages of planning or testing that are using renewable electricity and hydrogen to make green steel. And since 2021, Rio Tinto have been testing an approach using biomass in place of coking coal to reduce their iron ore. On the electrolysis side of things, Boston Metals website says that they expect their tech to be commercially available from about 2026. But theirs is a much less mature technology than the hydrogen and biomass based projects. So while we may see demonstration projects soon, I would expect that, like Bart says, it'll be more like a decade before we see scale for either their process or the low temperature electrolysis that Bart also talked about. Anyway, green steel is a really dynamic field with several competing technologies and different pros and cons for each. So I'm looking forward to following this topic closely over the next decade to see how it all plays out. The full conversation that I had with Bart was really interesting. Normally, I only share the full interviews with my Patreon community, but in this case, I've made an exception and put a link in a pinned comment for anyone to access. We covered a lot more than just steel. Uh, Bart has had the craziest, most varied career, and so he has insights on pretty much every aspect of the energy transition. And if you've got an hour free, I highly recommend a listen. Huge thanks to the Engineering with Rosie Patreon community whose support helps me to dedicate enough time to research these videos thoroughly and their feedback is so valuable to help me steer the channel in an interesting direction. If you'd like to join us and chat with like-minded energy nerds like me on the private Engineering with Rosie Discord server, then we would love to welcome you to the team. You can find the link in the description. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.